I posted up on xdtalk.com uh, that I was willing to do some training videos. Um, I'm trying to work through the process of doing more videos, mainly because it helps me at my real job um, kind of get better at teaching to a camera versus teaching to people, which is, for me, it's a whole lot more difficult to teach to a camera than it is to teach to a live audience. So this helps me with my real job, and I think it can provide some valuable training uh, to the goes of you that are out there on the cyber world, the interwebs, uh, they're asking for it. So one of the uh, the things I did, I did go on xdtalk.com and said, what are some sub 10 minute videos that you would like to watch? Something you'd be interested in. Now, I don't know if this one's actually going to be sub 10 minute. I, I expect this to be a little bit longer than that. Um, but a lot of the recommendations or requests were centered around fundamentals of marksmanship. You know, sight alignment, sight picture, trigger control, stuff like that. Um, what I'm going to do is, is teach my version of that, which I call weapon deployment, and it's techniques and fundamentals. I'm hoping that on the video you can kind of see the screen I'm working with here. Um, and you'll see that I break down these categories into techniques and fundamentals. Uh, and, and in my opinion, the technique is just a vehicle. It's the thing that delivers your fundamentals to the target. And it's important for you to understand the difference between the two so whenever you're assessing your own skill set, you're looking at your target, you're looking at your times, and you're trying to get better, knowing what each part of this process brings to the table in terms of your uh, combat effectiveness will help you self-assess and get better. And I'm always, I was that why kid, you know, every time somebody asks a question, my, my first response was why. I've never had a problem with instant willingness and obedience to orders, but if I know why I'm doing something, I typically do it better and I do it more, uh, more confidently. So I'm going to provide the why behind these. Um, if you have great fundamentals and poor technique, you can go to the range and put pretty little holes in paper and get smoked in a gunfight because you're slow. Okay, so range accuracy with no combat speed if you have great fundamentals and poor techniques. Um, problem is that's a lot of law enforcement officers at smaller departments that don't do a lot of high speed low drag training. That's your non-combat MOS people, that's your poorly trained security professionals, um, and a lot of people that enjoy guns as a hobby but all they ever get to do is stand on line, squeeze bang, squeeze bang. Uh, range accuracy with no combat speed, great fundamentals, poor technique. If you have a great technique and poor fundamentals, you probably watch a lot of TV, you probably play a lot of video games that are hyper-realistic. Um, that's a relative term. Um, but, in, but compared to Mario Kart, they're hyper-realistic. And you can have very good combat speed. In other words, you can shoot like a machine gun. You just don't hit anything. Not without luck, okay? Um, this is where your people that shoot up schools are at. These are your active shooters, typically. They, uh, they can mimic, they can parrot the look the techniques, the, the outward mechanics of proper combat effectiveness with a handgun or a long rifle or whatever the case may be, but they don't know what's going on between the shooter's ears and in their eyes, so they have a lot of the, the proper techniques just through parroting, but they do not have the appropriate fundamentals up here uh, or here. So combat speed, no accuracy, these are your active shooters. Um, and accuracy by volume, spray and pray, those kind of people. Uh, poor technique and poor fundamentals, you're gang bangers. Bang, 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 bang. Or Wild Bill Hickok shooting at you on his farm at the hip with a case of natural ice in his system. Okay? Uh, poor technique, poor fundamentals. Typically, you're going to lose the fight unless you're fighting somebody as bad, worse, or not as lucky as you are. And we can't bank on that as the good guys that we're going to be fighting people worse than us. So we can't bet on the fact that typically the guy in the alley that's going to pull a gun on you exists there. Now, you hear this statistic all the time, the average gunfight happens at 7 feet. Now, I don't care specifically about an average gunfight, I care about the one I'm in. Um, but that statistic is valuable in that it sends the message that your guy doesn't have to be super lucky to get accurate or get, or he doesn't have to be it doesn't take long to get act, uh, lucky enough to win at seven feet or ten feet or five yards, okay? It, you know, at, at this distance, spraying and praying is going to get you pretty quick. So um, I'm not saying you live or die in training by this mythical or hy hypothetical um, ten foot or seven foot handgun distance, but 
it should tell you you better be good because it won't take long for your hypothetical bad guy to get lucky pretty quickly at that distance. Um, and then where we want to be is combat effectiveness and, and, and you need great technique and great fundamentals for that. Now those of you that are kind of sharp all right, are picking up that technique is all about speed and fundamentals is all about accuracy. Um, the things that I'm going to list that are techniques which are stance, grip, and draw Okay, they have nothing to do with your accuracy. I don't care who tells you what. Nothing to do with your stance, grip, and draw. Accuracy, not at play. Doesn't matter how you draw the gun, how you stand, how you hold the gun, in terms of accuracy. All that does is let you be fast. Okay? Um, target acquisition and incidental targets, I'm going to refresh you on, or remind you on the uh, fundamentals of, of safety, those four cardinal safety rules, and the fourth one being know your target, target acquisition. And incidental targets, as speaking to the second half of that fourth weapon safety rule, know what's beyond or around your target. And then we get into the, the uh, actual fundamentals, sight alignment, sight picture, trigger control. Those are the core fundamentals. It's all about accuracy. has nothing to do with speed. And then you have follow through at the end, which is sort of, in my opinion, a little bit of both. Um, it's a little bit to do with accuracy uh, and a little bit to do with speed. Now. It, it, it mixes those two together, and we'll get to that whenever we talk about it, and I'll explain that in detail. But that's the most basic things you need to worry about in terms of combat effectiveness with a handgun. Uh, those things right there. Now, we could add a whole lot more. We could talk about communication, movement, cover, concealment, uh, and, and manipulating your weapon in and around those things. Um, but this is what you need to know to consider yourself effective with a handgun. Okay, so let's think. Let's talk about the stance first. Now, I'm already going to lose about 20% of my audience here talking about stance. Okay, let's let's go over what, in my opinion, the three combat effective stances are. The first one is the one you see everybody uh, uh, do on TV, and that's the Weaver stance. Body bladed to the target. Okay, both elbows bent. Um, uh, you know weapon in front of your dominant eye, this arm bent down, this arm bent out, pushing forward with your weapon hand, pulling in with your weak hand, pinching the weapon between the two. That is the weaver stance. Okay, It is combat effective. Um, another combat effective stance is center axis relock. Body almost perpendicular to the drop target, weak hand locking your elbow, rotating that at 90 degrees, shooting with your weak eye unless you happen to be cross-eyed dominant, and then your thumbs kiss on the inside. This is very good for up close. Center axis relock is also referred to as car a lot, and this is good in a car, but it has nothing to do with the acronym, but if you're at a window and you don't want to present the weapon outside the window um, to be taken, be it a vehicle or, or, or a house window, but you need to get close. Maybe you don't have enough concealment or cover out here to get far away from your threshold, but you don't want to project out of the threshold. This is good for that. But what I teach and what I recommend everybody do, everybody, you, you do this, okay? You do this is the isosceles stance. It is the best. It's the best, okay? It's the best unless you have some physical deformity that doesn't allow you to extend both of your arms. Otherwise, it's the best for everybody. It works with your psychology. It works with your physiology. It's the most mobile. Nobody guards a point guard like this because they'll burn you this way. No, no defensive back guards a wide receiver like this because they'll burn you this way. You need mobility in a gunfight. You need to get off the X. They're on an X. You're on the X. Whoever's moving is harder to hit. Okay, so when you draw that weapon, your lower body should be moving. Well, the Weaver stance is hard to move backwards and maintain stability under stress. It's a complex motor movement. You've got multiple things, multiple small muscle groups bent, and all these potential, there's infinite amount of places for this to gun to come out under stress, but you need it to be right here between your face and the target so that you can use your sight. That's hard to do under stress, okay? So while I teach the, um, and I could, I could spend an hour on this subject, and maybe I will one day, but I need to move on. You are mo more, more mobile in every direction in the isosceles stance. So isosceles, feet shoulder width apart, approximately weight on the front of your feet, leaning forward at the waist just a little bit, 
not taking a dump. You don't have to be super, super low. But just think about if somebody told you in 3, 2, 1, I'm going to push you. 3, 2, 1, what would you do? You'd brace yourself. And that's exactly what the isosceles stance is. You're just, you're pre-bracing for the recoil so that your hands don't have to do it when you're pulling the trigger. Okay? It's the most mobile. It's a gross motor movement. Straight up, straight out. It's easy to do under stress in comparison to a complex or fine motor movement. So like a uh, weaver in center axis relock. It is the best. If you want to know why, maybe I'll do another video about that. Just trust me. You need to try it. It works, unless you're from another planet and your bones work differently than mine do, it's faster. It's faster. Stance is a technique. It's all about speed. If I can move faster, then I am faster in a gunfight. Stance is a technique. Technique's all about speed. The Sosceles is the fastest mobility and in draw without having to do micro corrections, period. Moving on. Okay, so that is... Uh, your stance, what everything's built off of. Now, granted, you, I say get off the edge. The whole purpose of a stance is not to lock you somewhere and put roots down and grow like an oak tree. Your stance is a platform, a platform that needs to be mobile and still stay the same. Once again, why the isosceles is better. Okay, so if you're in the right stance, the next thing you need to worry about, okay, we've talked about this, is grip this being what was on the screen. So grip. You've got a gun in your holster and you, and you need to get a gun in your hand to draw. First thing you got to do is grip the weapon in the holster, okay? And this is where a lot of people make a mistake. You, tell, you put a gun on the counter and tell them to pick it up and get a good grip with one hand and then hold it down beside them. They typically do this and you see the gun in line with your hand. That's a good thing. You want your skeletal st structure to support that weapon. It doesn't have to be straight as an arrow down your hand, especially in isosceles. It needs to be lined up with your eye. But what you want is the butt of that weapon in between these two joints, okay? So that as you look down the weapon, okay, it's in line with your eye. You just don't want it on that knuckle, and obviously you wouldn't want it on this knuckle, okay? Because you're having to do weird things with your wrist and interrupt that skeletal structure uh, that's supporting the recoil. Recoil only does one thing in a gunfight and it slows you down. The further, the longer time that your that your uh, your your gun recoils, the further and the longer it recoils, the more time it takes you to do follow-up shots. If I want to shoot him in the head twice for whatever reason, bang, I gotta wait till this comes all the way back down. So supporting that recoil with your skeletal system is going to speed up your shots. Stance, techniques, all about speed, grip, technique, all about speed. The proper grip will limit recoil. It will make you faster in a gunfight. Okay, so we don't fight from the holster though. So when you take that same person that got a good one hand grip off the counter and tell them to do it from the holster, a lot of times they'll do something like this. They'll reach straight down, grab the gun, get an isosceles stance. Okay, everything looks good to go. Everything looks good to go until they put their hand down and now you see how crooked that gun is in my hand. It's lined up with that knuckle. It's, the recoil comes this way, and when you put that recoil in a round joint, attached to a round joint, attached to a hinge joint, attached to a round joint, I mean, it's got all this stuff it can do slowing you down, okay? So, you don't fight from the holster, so don't worry about what's comfortable in the holster. You need to get a good one-hand grip, straight in line with your arm, pretty much, and somewhere in between these two knuckles, this knuckle and this knuckle, okay? And then go to the holster and see what happens. A lot of people will lean out. Well, if I have to lean out to get that grip in, I'll have to lean out to get it out like that, okay? Or you have to manipulate the gun in the holster or get really tied up in there, but you got to do whatever it is you need to do to make sure that once that weapon's out, it's in line the way it should be. So once you've mastered that one hand grip and it's coming out in line with your arm or relatively in line somewhere between these two knuckles, while we're, while we're on that, let's, before we go to two hand grip, Let's talk about shooting with one hand. Everybody knows, most people know, this is the wrong way. Bang, 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 bang. Okay. A lot of people think this is the right way. Bang, 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 bang. This is just as wrong as this. Two bones in this part of your arm, one bone here. They lock at the elbow. If you stand relaxed, you'll notice that you don't stand like this or like this. They're at about a 55 degree angle. It's the same angle you would punch from. You don't punch like this. You don't punch like this because it dislocks this. You don't have your, you're not bringing your kinetic energy from your waist and your hips to add to that punch. So just in the same angle you'd punch with, 
is the same angle you would draw one-handed to shoot a weapon, about 55 degrees. A little closer to the top than it is to the side, but it limits recoil, so you go bang, 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 instead of bang, 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 or bang, bang, bang. Moving on. If you don't believe me, put yourself on a shot timer and shoot like this and then shoot at a 55 degree angle. And if you want to, throw some Tupac out there too and you'll see that that 55 degree angle, you're faster maintaining accuracy. If you don't believe me, try it. Okay. So, two-handed grip. We've got this in line with our arm. What you want to do with the semi-automatic is you want to put as much of this part of your palm, this part of your hand, against the weapon as possible. Okay and then use these fingers to hold these fingers to the weapon and consciously squeeze front to back with your strong hand and side to side with your weak hand and you'll have 360 degrees of pressure around that weapon and you want to point your thumbs with the semi at your bad guy just like you have your trigger finger pointed at your bad guy until it's ready to fire okay what that does is give you all the more natural instinct to point that weapon and it also, you really need to get this thumb out there as far as you can without losing a grip down here. So that when you open your hand, it goes down at about a 45 degree angle. You don't want it back here doing this. The whole idea of well, pushing this thumb forward is it's locking this wrist. The gun can recoil at your wrist, it can recoil at your elbows, and it can recoil at your shoulders. By locking my weak wrist and clamping it to the gun that's also being held by my strong hand, I'm effectively locking both of my wrists. Okay, so I've limited one place it can recoil. By being in a isosceles stance, it can't really recoil at my shoulder, my elbows all that much. Okay, because I have them pretty well locked. They're not forcibly locked out, but they're close to it. There's not going to be a lot of recoil at my elbows. But if I've limited the recoil at my wrist and my elbows, the only place it can really recoil is my shoulder. And you'll notice a difference between bang, 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 and bang, 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 bang. Hear the tempo? Grip is a technique. Techniques are all about speed. A proper two-handed grip, which starts with a good one-handed grip, built off an isosceles platform, Okay, we'll limit recoil and speed up your follow-up shots. You need speed and accuracy to win a gunfight, so this is important. That left hand, left thumb out there, lock that left wrist, so the only place it's really going to recoil, okay, is your shoulders. Two-handed grip, front to back, side to side, push that thumb out, locking this wrist. You can shoot faster that way. Moving on. Um, talked about two-handed grip. The only thing you're really doing different with a revolver in that same grip is instead of having your thumbs out, you want to tuck them down. Because anything that inhibits that cylinder from moving or a circle is also going to keep it from firing. Okay, so that's obviously important. <clears throat> now, draw. You've got a weapon in your holster and a bad guy in your face, and you need to connect those two dots. Now, the way to do that is with draw. Um, this is one of those things that everybody can practice for free. I don't care what the rules are at your range. Okay? This is about two or three boxes worth of ammo. This plastic gun here. And they make one for your gun. They make one. You just got to look for it. Get one of these. So even if you live in an apartment, you can practice this kind of stuff. Okay? I've, I've done videos about this. <laughs> excuse me. Done videos about this and talked about this ad nauseum. It's typically that that gets you smoked in a gunfight not any of this stuff okay it's going from hey man it's cool to getting your weapon out there faster than they do and as the good guy we're playing catch up so when they the gun comes out of their waist here and yours is still buried under a shirt in your holster you got to get your gun out and on them and pull the trigger before they do so you need to practice the draw it's extremely important i think it's the most under practice aspect of combat handgun marksmanship Okay, so those of you that like to read, I'll put this stuff um, on the screen while I'm yapping. So the draw. I teach a five count draw. I'm going to make it look super complicated, then magic fairy dust it and make it simple. Okay, and, and before I even get into that, what, what you're going to see me do with this five count draw is going to look very choppy and robotic. 
I, I, I liken it to a skeleton. If you look at a skeleton, there's a lot of sharp edges. But if you look at a person, uh, you know, we don't have quite as sharp of edges, maybe some of us we used to, but none of us are as sharp as a skeleton. So these five counts are going to be the skeletal structure for the draw stroke. And then I'm going to smooth them out, put muscle and skin on those bones, and show you how to make take your body with your gun, your holster, your waistline, your arm length, your shoulder width, and how you can get that gun out as fast as physics will allow you to with your own draw stroke. So I'm going to go through the five counts. I'm going to dumb them down to three, and then we're going to smooth it out, okay, to make it something that you can do. All right, step number one, okay, I'm in my base. I'm going to the gun and to my side, okay, to the gun and to my side. This hand's very important. You know, I see a lot of people draw up like this, and this is a one-inch mistake. When you draw up and meet your hand out there and clap them together, don't be surprised when one day that happens. It's a one-inch mistake, and if you don't think you can make a one-inch mistake under combat stress, you're fooling yourself, okay? So I never want this hand in front of my weapon. I also want to be able to block a knife or some sort of close quarters attack here, still don't have my hand in front of the gun, and go bang, 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 bang into my bad guy. Because if I just grab the gun and punch it out, I'm getting stabbed or bashed in the head. I've got to deflect and shoot at the same time. Okay, or maybe you need to move a good guy out of the way to engage the bad guy behind him. So this is this multitasking here with this left hand. It's not just here for tactical shapes. Okay, wah wah wah. All right, step number one to the side and to your gun. I'm disabling whatever retention device I have at this point. Okay, that's one. Two is straight up, just far enough to clear the holster. Three at the wrist, pointed at the guy trying to kill you. Four. Peeling this, peeling this hand off my chest. The gun shouldn't come out, and then I meet it. I'm peeling this off my chest, and then five, I'm all the way out in my, my two-hand grip and an isosceles. Okay, so to the weapon, straight up, point at the bad guy, peel it off my chest, all the way out in the isosceles stance. Okay, that is the skeletal version of what I want you to do, the skeletal version. So let me take those five counts to the gun, straight up, angle, peel off all the way out, and let's take those and dumb them into three. It's to the gun, straight up, straight out. To the gun, straight up, straight out. Now, let's add some meat and skin onto that to smooth it out. What you first need to do, don't draw, just administratively, if you will, get into a good two-hand isosceles stance. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my holster, and I'm not going to let go with my weak hand until I absolutely have to. Now, I had to let go here because there's nowhere else for my... I can't put the gun in the holster with both hands. I have to let go here. And if you'll watch that same thing, it's slow and smooth, just directly to the holster, economy of motion. I'm getting rid of anything that doesn't help me get the gun to the holster. Well, when I reverse that... That is the path of least resistance. That's the most value, the economy of motion, the most value in that, in that movement, in that draw stroke for my body where my holster is. Okay, To the gun, straight up. And you'll notice that this part is now happening while presenting the weapon. I'm not drawing up wasting time. I'm not doing Charlie's Angels wasting time. I'm going to the gun and straight like there's a knife on the end and I'm stabbing it into my bad guy and into a good two-hand grip and an isosceles stance. It's the path of resistance. It's, it's the only fastest way to draw a gun if you're going to go all the way out. And for me personally, on a shot timer, the difference between shooting at three, bang, at a really close target, and shooting at five in that same draw stroke with a lot of practice is almost non-existent. I mean, the, the, once you've done all the hard stuff to get to here, that doesn't take very long. And if you're hearing that from a guy that really gripes about tenths of a second in a draw stroke or, or any kind of shot timed event. Okay, so if you practice that whole draw stroke slow, smooth, smooth as fast, you'll get to the point where you can pretty much engage from about this point about the same time if you're trying to purposely stop and shoot from here. Okay, so to the gun and stab it into your bag eye wherever you want to shoot behind your eyes. Okay. <clears throat> Next, target acquisition. Remember the first part of that fourth safety rule. Know your target. Is that guy 
pulling a gun out? Is that guy pulling a cell phone out? Is that guy pulling a knife out to attack? to throw, to charge, or pulling a knife out seeing that you got a gun and drop it. Those are important things to know before a bullet comes flying out your barrel at 600 miles an hour. <clears throat> you also might want to find cover or concealment. Cover is anything that will significantly slow down or stop a projectile. Concealment will hide you, which is better. Whichever one's closer. Most things that are cover are also concealment. Obviously bulletproof glass isn't. Um, distance can be cover. You can be covered by distance. If I'm shooting at you with the handgun and you're a thousand yards away, you might as well be behind a, a, behind a brick wall, especially if you're just doing this. Am I still going to stand there and let you shoot at me and see if you get lucky? No. Okay, but distance to some degree can be covered, especially when talking about from adversaries with handguns. Uh, if you're engaged in a gunfight, you need to get off the X. All right, if you imagine we're about to shoot each other on three and the timer goes one, two, three, and I'm stepping and drawing at the same time, that's, I'm not really... All this is happening from the lower body. It doesn't affect my upper body at all. So I can step and draw just as quickly as I can stand here and draw. Okay? And when you're under the kind of flight or fight stress that a bad guy might be, you know, pulling a gun out to rob the convenience store while you're standing there at the checkout desk or, or at the, the cash register, you know, they're probably walking up expecting, now I'm in charge and everybody listen to me. See what I'm doing? Hey, 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 hey. Hey, hey, I'm standing still. I'm just pointing my power flashlight around. But if you're at that cash register, it's bang! It's like spraying a water hose in your yard. You watch the water trail. Well, that's what kind of happens to your body to some degree when you're trying to engage multiple targets or moving targets. So if you become a moving target without slowing down your draw stroke, bang! You have a much better chance of winning than going high noon. So you need to get off the X and if you're going to be moving anyway you might as well move towards something that's either going to stop a bullet or hide you. Alright, incidental targets. The second part of that fourth weapon safety rule know what's behind and around your target. Sometimes your bad guy deserves a bullet but the environment doesn't give you a reasonably safe shot. Uh, the thing you need to think about is what is my bullet going to touch first? What is my bullet going to touch last? Hopefully both of those things are the bad guy, okay? It better be first be the bad guy, okay? Uh, unless you're shooting through some sort of limited concealment. If they're standing behind a paper target and you're shooting through the paper at them. That's, that's different. But the first valuable thing your bullet touches needs to be the bad guy. And if anything you can do um, to control it, it needs, the last thing your bullet needs to touch needs to be the bad, bad guy. So once again, we're getting off the X anyway. Um, if this is my bad guy and Creepy Ken back there is my good guy, if I'm getting off the X anyway, let's say I'm standing here. Okay? I gotta move anyway. I don't know if you can see me. I'm, I'm tell you what, I know you can't see me. I'll, I'll adjust here. So if I'm shooting the bad guy here, okay, and you can see sort of my path, I'm gonna shoot straight through my bad guy and potentially into my good guy. So when I move, I might as well move in a way that limits my incidental targets. Now I know you're still seeing that same camera angle, but if I turn this laser on and show you the wall, I'm not at Creepy Ken anymore. Okay, this is, this is the, the vertical line on the wall where, where my target will be hitting. I'm, I'm well off of Creepy Ken over there. So if you're going to be moving in a gunfight, move towards cover and concealment, and if you can, in an angle that limits incidental targets being hit by your projectiles. Uh, Alright, so now we've, we've covered the techniques, we've covered the fourth weapon safety rule. Let's talk about the core fundamentals. Uh, the first thing is sight alignment. Sight alignment really is just looking through your rear sight and finding your front sight. You, you're holding this gun, um, this white line is an invisible line, okay? You're looking through the rear sight if you're going to shoot me in the forehead and lining up your front sight to be equal height and then equal light on both sides. So centered and level on my forehead. That's all sight alignment is. It's just lining the sights up to themselves while the front sight is in the middle of what you want to hit. So center mass shot, this would not be aligned. This would not be aligned. This would not be aligned. All this other goofy stuff. Two hand shot, side alignment. One hand shot, side alignment. Okay. So 
That's all side alignment is. Um, but people struggle with that. So let me show you some pictures. Okay. If you look on the screen here, my eye is higher off the ground in elevation than where I want to hit. So obviously my gun's going to be pointed down, but from my perspective, the sights are still level. I'm looking through that rear sight, and from my perspective, okay, from my perspective, the sights are still level. See how that works? From my perspective, perspective, the sights are still level. So when I say level, I don't mean like you're holding a bowl of soup and it's got to be level with the ground or you're going to spill it. It's level between that imaginary line going from your eye to where you want to hit the target. And it doesn't really matter your height uh, or what the angle is. You're shooting low, shooting high, shooting from your back. None of that really matters. You're leveling those sights out by looking through the rear sight notch on a notch and post sights and getting that front sight level across the top. Ignore the dots. Ignore the little bucket on the Glock sights. Ignore all that stuff. If it's a notch and post sight, you want the tip of the front sight level with the tip of the rear sight and equal space between them. Between the imaginary line of your eye and the target. The end on side of line. Now, see the screen? This is some examples of how not to do it. This is what a lot of people do. They have the front, they look over the rear sight and put the front sight on their target, not remembering that the, bear, the gun, the bullet goes down the barrel, it doesn't just fly out of the front sight. So it's important um, that you line all that stuff up so you actually know your gun's pointed. Now, this one, I know you can't tell on the camera, they're looking through the rear sight, but there is no front sight there. It's down low. So once again, they're using that window, but they're not putting a front sight in it and they're going to shoot low. Now, Let's talk about sight picture. The human eye only focuses on one distance at a time. Now, with well-aimed shots, we're talking precision shots, 15-yard shots, 7-yard shots maybe, you need to focus on the front sight. Now, in a combat environment, when you're drawing and shooting, you're going to be looking at your target, and no amount of training is going to change that. In fact, if I'm shooting you, if, I, if you can imagine this distance that's representative on this video, if I'm shooting you, I'm not going to focus. When I, if, if you're pulling a gun out and I, gotta go, and I know here, oh my gosh, i got to shoot this guy, I'm not going to get out here and then shift my focus to the front side, okay, at that distance. Now, if I'm taking a 20-yard shot, you've got to. If you want to hit your bad guy, you've got to. All right, so I'm going to teach you sight picture in the way that's the most accurate, it's the most precise, understanding that in a combat environment you don't have time sometimes to shoot minute of button. Sometimes you just got to use minute of chest, which you can do with a lot of practice, good muscle memory in your isosceles stance, and, okay, practicing that draw stroke to the point where it gets to sight alignment almost subconsciously. If I close my eyes, I know I have an idea of where, where that lens is on the camera. If I close my eyes and draw what I think it would be, open my eyes, I mean, it's, I was a little bit off to the angle, but I've already got sight picture and alignment. If you can look down my sights, they're level between my eye and the lens. That comes from training, it comes from drawing a bunch of times, and I can, that helps me stay precise even when I have to focus on the target because of a time constraint. All right, remember, once we get to sight alignment and c through here, we're, we're talking about precision, not about speed, okay? So you, you, sometimes you have to sacrifice a little bit of precision to get around on target. The difference between shooting minute of chest and minute of button. Okay. Um, you need to be able to shoot minute of button though, if you want to, because you have to be able to start here and lose a little bit to stay here. If all you can do is this, when you lose a little bit, some of your shots aren't hitting the target. Okay, so it's important to learn how to do this. And the proper sight picture is picture I will only focus on one distance at a time. You've got this in my chest, okay, from your perspective, it's right here. If you focus on this, the rear sight, one thing is if you're looking at it, you're not looking through it, okay? But even if you try to look around the edges of this, everything in front of you is going to be blurry. Now, you don't need the target to be crystal clear to take a, a precision shot. You just need to know that you're really still pointed at them when the bullet flies out. And part of that is to maintain some visibility of this. Remember, sight alignment is important to know where your gun's actually pointed. And you need to be able to maintain this to make a precise shot. 
Um, once again, in the combat environment, what, what I tell people to do is try to find a flash sight picture in alignment. Um, perfect sight picture is you're focusing right here. Um, horrible sight picture is at very great distances with the need to place a precision shot you're focused right here and then this is just a blurry mess but once again with enough practice good muscle memory of ending in precision you won't have to focus directly on this to still be doing it with your mechanics okay so um, that's why muscle memory is so important with a precise shot though, when precision is required, you have to focus here. And once again, being capable of doing that at will will translate to being more precise even when not perfectly focused on the front side. When you're doing what we call point shooting, where I'm at normal defensive distances and my focus never leaves my target, but I'm still placing combat effective and accurate shot. So, um, you got to be able to do it at the most precision possible to have a foundation to step down from and still maintain combat accuracy. So, here's a perspective of, of what not to do. Uh, if you can see on screen, target's perfectly clear. The sights on this revolver the cameraman's holding completely blurry there's no way to know if he's really pointing directly at the target for a precise minute of button shot but you can still tell it's close enough that he's going to be in that person if this was a combat environment um, the opposite of this okay or, or not the opposite but another thing people tend to do if you really tell them hey you're looking over the rear sight you're looking over the rear sight you're looking over the rear sight what they tend to do is start focusing on the rear sight and then everything forward of that is blurry, which is a bad thing too if you need precision. Remember, you, there's a time to train for uh, point shooting and, and everything's about speed and there's a time to, to train for, for absolute precision and a combat environment's going to exist typically somewhere between the two. And here's a, per a perspective of what it should be uh, when it's right. You know, your sights are lined up across the top, equal space on brunt, both sides, that sight alignment, but to maintain that during the firing process when precision is the goal you have to do the proper sight picture to to keep that there until the gun goes off so the target's blurry front sight's crystal clear rear sight's a little bit blurry uh, this is what it should look like at the end of your hand obviously those are revolver sights but a semi sights it's the same principle lined up across the top equal space on both sides front sight's crystal clear the rest of the world's a little bit blurry now the reason why you can sacrifice a little bit of perfect sight picture in a gunfight and still be combat effective is that all sight picture does is allow you to maintain sight alignment. The thing is sight alignment is fairly forgiven in about this, unless you're shooting a long range shots that have to be precision, typical defensive distances with a handgun, you have a lot of forgiveness in this alignment. What you don't have any forgiveness in is this and that's trigger control. Um, trigger control is in my experience as a firearms instructor is the hardest thing to teach somebody to do properly it's the thing that most people screw up um, and usually it's because they're flinching they're making the gun go bang right now um, instead of allowing the mechanics of the gun to work and to follow the whole process um, it's not where your sights are lined up when you start pulling the trigger, it's where they're lined up when the gun goes off. So, let me get my handy dandy bad guy back out here and get where you can see him. If, if I'm going to place this shot right here on him, okay, I got good stance, sight picture alignment, and doing all the techniques, all the fundamentals, but then I jerk the trigger, that's where my shot's going to be, okay, down here. Because during the time I'm engaging this trigger, if I'm also moving the weapon, there will be some distance traveled before the gun goes off. Okay? You need to start doing it the textbook right way and then adapt that for the combat environment. You shouldn't be in a gunfight with a bad guy at this distance going squeeze, 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 bang, and letting the gun surprise you like everybody says you squeeze the trigger and let the gun surprise you you need to start there on the range but you can't end there in a gunfight you can't go 
Get off the X, draw! Squeeze, 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 bang! You're already dead. You're already dead, okay? So you have to be able to make the trigger go bang when you want it to without flinching, but you gotta train that flinch out. You're only afraid of two things at birth. You're afraid of loud noises and falling. And you're really not afraid of falling, you're instinctively afraid of splatting on the ground. And another way of translating that is something that could hurt you flying towards your body quickly is something that you're instinctively afraid of and loud noises. So what does a gun do? It makes a loud noise and flies towards your body. Okay? The recoil. So you have to teach yourself not to instinctively respond to that by bracing for the the recoil when it's going to happen. And that's why they tell you you want to surprise yourself with the trigger pull because when you go squeeze, 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 and you don't know where the gun's going to go off or when it's going to go off, it'll go off and recoil before you, you have a chance to try to react to it. But when you know for a fact, I'm going to make the gun go bang now, your brain knows that too in the subconscious part of your body or your mind, and it's going to flinch typically. You need to start doing the whole surprise thing. Squeeze, 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 bang. Squeeze, 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 bang. And letting off just enough to reset the trigger. We'll talk about that with follow through. But eventually you need to be able to go bang, 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 bang. And there's no way it, it, to not anticipate that. In fact, if you train as much as you should be, even dry, you're going to learn your trigger so well there's nothing you can do to make yourself not anticipate it when it breaks. I, I can squeeze the trigger as slow as I possibly can and still be making movement. I still know exactly the moment it's going to go off because I know my trigger. I've pulled it plenty of times. So this idea that you have to shoot all the time with some surprise trigger pull is faulty and it'll get you smoked in a gunfight. But it's where you got to start to build up. Just like with sight picture. You got to start with perfect sight picture. You got to start with perfect sight alignment so that you have a platform that you can step away from as the environment dictates. You can't just throw wildly into the night, ah, oh, bang, 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 and never be able to shoot well aimed, slow, controlled, surprise shots, okay? Um, or surprises that can be as you learn your trigger. So, the way I tell people when you're learning the perfect way to gain that platform to step away from as the environment dictates, treat your trigger like the brake pedal on a car. Uh, when you need to slow down, you don't just go and smash the car in front of you. You also don't press the brake so slow that the weight of the brake stops your foot and you go full speed and slam into the car in front of you. It's a happy medium. Um, you press the brake slow and strong and smooth until you've pressed enough to what the outcome you're looking for happens. It's the same way with the trigger pull. It's slow and smooth. I'm not letting the weight of the trigger affect how fast I pull, the, I pull it, okay? I'm controlling that with my finger strength, okay? And on a semi-automatic striker-fired weapon, the trigger is going to go through all these various stages of weight and, and travels and preloads and dropping sears and, and, and all this stuff. Okay, so I've just decided I'm going to pull the trigger this fast no matter what happens up underneath it. Okay, and that is trigger press. That's the proper trigger control. You need to start there, but don't expect that's the starting point, not the ending point. Don't expect to have time to do that in a combat environment unless you're taking a 40 yard pistol shot at a guy that doesn't know you're there, then yeah, you're going to get proper breath control, hopefully brace on something, squeeze, 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 because you need precision, you need perfection, okay? And there's a time and a place for both. The time and place for perfection in a gunfight is almost never, especially with a handgun. Nobody's out there as the designated handgun marksman, okay? So, but there is the potential for that need in, in the real world. Uh, a hostage scenario, and you've got to put a hole here and not a hole here. You know, I'm the good guy and the bad guy's got a gun in my head. I need to put a hole here, not here. You need perfection for that, okay? You're probably going to squeeze that trigger slow, slower than you would on a three-round controlled uh, group uh, or, or a, the double tap, a controlled pair. So, this is the least forgiving. So, that's why you need, if you can't put, now I, I'm going to step on some toes here. If you can't put a whole magazine 
of whatever you carry out of whatever you, whatever weapon and whatever ammo you shoot, if you can't put a whole magazine of that in a one and a half inch square at three to five yards, then you don't go any faster until you can do that. You go as slow and smooth as you can on your trigger pull until you can put a whole magazine out of your weapon into a one and a half inch square at three yards before you ever shoot any faster. And if you can't do that, I'm not saying not to carry your weapon, but don't consider yourself combat effective because you need to start from the ability to be perfect before you can have something to step down from in a combat environment. So go train until you can do that, and you should be able to do that, especially if you have an instructor. Go find a class. If you live in the Birmingham area, call me. But if you have a good instructor over your shoulder, I haven't met anybody that I can't get into that group in a few hours unless they're terrified of the gun. That's the only thing I can't fix for you. Um, if you're not blind and you have enough mechanical strength in your finger to pull the trigger and you're not terrified of the gun, you should be able to do that in an afternoon, get to that group size with an instructor over your shoulder helping you. Um, you got to be able to do it perfect to step away from it. That's why I'm telling you, you need to master this before you go out there and try to do this. But you can shoot, bang, 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 knowing exactly when your gun goes off without flinching but you got to get to there through practice, okay? And training out that instinctual response to that recoil and loud noise, okay? Um, the only thing left really to do is follow through, and all follow through is is going through the whole shot cycle before um, you go to the next shot, okay? And I know you can't read this on the screen, the little words that are, that are in this up here, but, uh, but I'll, I'll kind of coach you through it as we go through. So here's the starting point. That's where you're here and you're thinking, I know now I gotta shoot that guy. There's a gun coming out of his waistband. I know now I gotta shoot him. That's the start point. So I decide to shoot, I draw my weapon, sights on target, pulling the slack out of the trigger, verifying that my sights are pointed exactly where I want them to be, not necessarily through a focused front sight, perfect sight picture, but a flash sight picture. There's a front sight coming past my eye, it's on the bad guy, that's what I'm talking about. You just, in a, in a split segment, cognizant of the fact that that front sight is somewhere near your rear sights and in your bad guy center mass. Squeeze, 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 bang, the gun goes off. I want you to watch the front sight come up. Don't look at your, don't, you know, try to maintain that. F I'm still really focused at my bad guy in combat, but I want you to be aware of that gun raising. And when that, when that front sight settles right back down, and that's all this is doing, I'm resetting the trigger during that recoil, I'm letting the front sight fall back down and getting a flash sight picture, sight alignment. It's just that split second that it's back down level, I feel it settle, I see it there and not here. Do I need to shoot? If so, I'll repeat the process, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze back. Now, you need to practice that to gain perfection like this. So decide to shoot, sights on target, shift your front sight, fo your focus to the front sight. This is training for perfection to have something to step away from in a combat environment. Squeeze, 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 maintaining, pitch, focus on this main, so that I can maintain this as perfectly as possible. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. Eventually the gun's going to go bang. Watch this front sight lift. I'm resetting the trigger when I feel that just far enough to let it reset and ready to be pulled again. As it settles down, as soon as I see it get about right here, I preload the striker, squeeze, 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 bang. I watch the front sight lift, watch it settle back down when it stops, squeeze, 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 bang. And when you can do it, it should look like this. When, you remember, I understand this is, this is not combat speed or not combat focus, but this is how you train yourself to get there. Squeeze, 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 bang, squeeze, 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 bang, maintain and focus, squeeze, bang, bang. Bang, hear the cadence. Bang, bang, bang. And then eventually what you're going to do is you're going to go squeeze, 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 bang, reset the trigger. As the recoil's coming back down, I'm already preloading it. Squeeze, 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 bang. And then it's, you're bouncing your front sight into your alignment. Bang, 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 bang. And you see the cadence is getting faster. I'm resetting and preloading. You can't do this without timing your trigger and knowing exactly when it's going off, which means you can't do this until you've trained out that instinctual response to the recoil and loud noises. You can't surprise yourself and shoot this way. Bang, 
Bang, bang, bang, bang, bang, bang, bang, bang, bang, bang, bang, bang, bang. I'm still shooting with side alignment every time. Now, you're going to point shoot and do this at five yards. You're going to point shoot and do this for sure at seven feet. But even at a seven yard, ten yard target where you have to be aware in a split second that all this is here somehow and you're sort of focusing somewhere between your target and your front sight at some invisible middle distance, that's kind of what I do when I shoot fast at a far away target. Uh, I'm sort of splitting my focus in the middle distance so that I still see exactly what my bad guy's doing and I also have enough awareness of where this is to know that if it's here or if it's not here and that's important. Now obviously your whole gun's not going to shift off but if this is here and you imagine that angle okay you've missed. So you gotta be aware that you're still you, the only place you can hit is your bad guy. So you still gotta be aware of all this and the balance between perfect sight alignment because of perfect sight picture and point shooting where it's just bang 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 that balance comes from being able to do both and starting from here and here being perfection when what you see what you process what you feel in your finger perfection and fundamentals you step away from that uh, in a combat environment and, and find the right balance for your specific situation uh, once again a 15-yard shot on a head some guy holding a gun to someone's head you're squeezing the trigger slow and you're doing you're looking for perfection you're looking for precision uh, a five feet away ten feet away 15 feet away maybe even drawing bang 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 using muscle memory flash sight picture and focusing mainly on my target to see what he or she's doing to know how many rounds it's going to take to make them stop um, don't start with speed and try to aim, add accuracy it's like buying a Ferrari and trying to learn how to drive your, your car is faster but you will be slow um, and slower than you would have been if you'd have bought a V6 Mustang and worked your way up to a Ferrari because you, it's hard to gain skill at speed you gain skill through precision and then add speed as you can do it without sacrificing combat accuracy uh, and this has been a long video, way longer than 10 minutes, okay? But, I, you know, I think it's something that people can get. If you've got some time to, to invest into to doing this, 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 is, this is where combat effectiveness comes from. It comes from having a good stance, knowing how to grip your weapon the proper way and draw it in a way that gets it there, okay? And then once you get it there, knowing what to look at, when you can sacrifice precision for, for speed um, and still be able to have enough muscle memory to do it without sacrificing combat accuracy. Okay, so the end. I'm rambling and this is going on forever. So if you have a question, post it up in the comments, post, send me a PM, whatever. Uh, you know, we're all better if we're all better, if you understand. The, the gun culture, the more um, professional, the more. Um, What's the word I'm looking for? I guess better. If, if we're just out there and we're competent, the more competent we are, the better off the whole gun community is and the better off the general public is if you live in a place where you're carrying this gun anyway. Um, it, it's a huge responsibility to strike on something that's, that implements deadly force as easily as a firearm does. And if you're going to take on that responsibility, it, you need to train yourself to be better for the environment and not worse for the environment. And a gun doesn't make you better it makes you more powerful. Your skill set makes you better for the environment. So invest in some time, find an instructor, okay, do some training, find multiple instructors, instructors. Pull pull things what works for you, okay? Um, there's some things that are universal. <laughs> Sosalee stance. <clears throat> Sorry. Got that stuck in my throat. Some things are universal. There are there are many ways, but there are some best ways. Um, but pick and pull, but get out there and invest in yourself. Uh, if you care enough to be even watching this video at this point, you're probably the kind of person that's willing to do that if you have the means to do so. So do it. Send questions. Ask questions. Let me, let me know if you have anything specific you want me to elaborate on, uh, and, and I'll do my best to help you help yourself. And remember, when the tide goes up, all the ships rise. So get out there. Be confident if you're going to get out there in the environment with a weapon on your hip.